How's it going, guys? Good. I'll give you a cut time. As All right, cool. Yeah, end. yeah. Cause you want to spend like what, 15 minutes casting over there or something? Yeah, I want to spend. Yeah, I'm gonna do a. I'm gonna do a casting demo for these center pin reels, like after. So you guys will like. I don't know what room that that is. It's, but just, it's a yeah, ballroom. Yeah, yeah. All the way over. So I gotta cut it out early, but. What I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to show you exactly how to rig up a float rig from like the beginning to the end right now. Since Albert just brought this fancy, nice new setup right here. So what I got here, I got, uh, it's one of our new Colville Precision Reels. This is a Fjord right here. It's that reel with the finger tabs that I've been talking about a lot online and everything. Just came out. This is the first line of them. This model is the Iron Man series. So when I typically rig up a three piece, I don't put it all together, but I'll keep it broken down into three and just make sure you don't miss any guys when you do it. So this is a 13 footer. So this is a 15 pound blood run, which is typically like most other brands would be like a 10 or a 12 pound diameter. What's the diameter on this, Greg? The floating uh, mono? 13 thousandths. So all I fish is a 15. I don't really go. He's got a 10 and a 15 pound. So 15 is just, I put all my shot right on my main line. So it allows me to slide the shot up and down. and never get any fraying or anything like that on this stuff. And knots are super easy to untangle with this guy. So 15 pound is nice. And if I want to bump up to 8 or 10 pound floral, I don't have to worry about it. And you never get a backlash on that reel, right? Oh yeah, yeah. no, you're gonna have you're gonna have a few backlashes to start. But once you get uh, once you get used to it, you don't want to learn how to cast the easy way. You definitely want to learn how to cast the the correct way, which is spinning the reel when you're casting. So are you talking about a Wallace cast? Yeah, wa a Wallace cast. Wallace are BC casts. If you have a heavy enough float, like anything like 11 grams or higher, you could typically load the rod and kind of sling it out there and just slow the reel down with your fingers. It's almost like casting a bait caster. You just have to make sure that you don't overcast it and get a backlash. This particular reel has a textured rim on it though, so that really helps, that really aids in being able to tell when you need to slow down your reel when it's spinning. So I make sure, I'll double check that I hit every single guide because there's nothing worse than going out there in the morning and realize you missed a guide. It's like the worst thing in the world, waiting for the sun to come up and you realize that one of the guides doesn't have the line through it. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do, guys, I'm gonna start with three pieces of silicone tubing. A lot of these floats, you really only need two pieces of silicone tubing, but you always run three in case the top one breaks so you have a backup one because there's nothing worse than, than having to re-rig for a little piece of silicone tubing. And I'll kind of draw, I'll draw kind of what I'm doing so you guys can kind of see it too.
And you can see it on the back of that blood run um, flyer too. You can see how it's all rigged up. You can see the split shot, the float, all the split shot tapering from heaviest to lightest. So pretty much what I'm doing is I got my line coming out. This is from the rod coming down. I'm gonna start off with two pieces of small silicone tubing and then one long piece. And I'm gonna have a barrel swivel right here. And then my fluorocarbon. And then whatever my bait presentation is. So like I was saying earlier, I keep all my terminal tackle in one nice little box. I got all my tubing, all my barrel swivels, all my different size hooks, all in one little thing, really easily accessible right in the front of your waders at all times. And then I have a backup box just in case that one tends to go in the water. So my day isn't over. Can you throw those little boxes in? Uh, yeah, I don't have any at the shop though. I have them at the, I have them at my, or I don't have any at the show, I have a bunch at my shop. One of my most important tools too is a pair of hemostats that have scissors in there with a little jig punch right there. This is pretty much the only tool I really need. This and my little uh, my little split shot removing tool that I showed earlier. Pretty much those two tools are the only thing you really need for the whole entire setup. And then my bottom piece of tubing, this, this one right here, the reason I cut it longer is so it hangs below the stem of the float. So when I stack my lead right below the bottom of the float, there's no rattling going on when it's drifting. So there's no rattling on the top of the surface current. Because if your shot's right against the, uh, the stem, you're gonna get a lot of that. Don't they say they have the, uh, the silicon extending beyond the, the wood on both ends though? Both to protect the, to soften the line too or no? No, I, I haven't experienced that, but you, I mean, I, I suppose it wouldn't hurt to do that. Okay. I mean, what a lot kind of, of these are- What do you use? Um, I like, mostly I like, you know, Drennan or Blood Run has a new line of floats out that are really nice, a really nice set of balsas. And they have them in all different sizes, but I would say mostly all loafers or little teardrop like acorn floats or like an Avon style. That's gonna depend on what type of water I'm fishing. It's gonna depend on what float I select. If you want one good float for all around, it's gonna be a, uh, an, uh, a loafer is gonna be your best. All right, so now I got my float all rigged up. I got my, my three pieces of silicone tubing. I got my one extended down past the shaft. So I'm all pretty much rigged and ready. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is put a micro barrel swivel on the end of my main line. I think the size of that micro swivel makes a big difference. I mean, we've got 
twelves, tens. Yeah, I know a lot of guys that fish eights, and they say that. I tell the guys go as small as you can go that you could still see, but make sure that they're like a pound rating wise. Like the, the poundage of what they break at is put on the actual pack of swivels. Like Raven doesn't put what pound they break at. So their small swivel is a 4XS, which is four extra small, and they break at like eight pound. Like you could literally pull them together and snap them in half. Yeah. So like the owner of 14s break at 30. It says right on the package what size. So. But I mean, do you think it adds to any of the weight at all? Like, would it could have replaced the shot, or do you even consider that if you were to use like a number eight size swivel? Or I mean, you get away with it. I don't find a huge difference. I mean, the bigger the swivel is, the better it's going to rotate too. But when you start getting into those really micro shots of fours and the sixes, that swivel can sometimes weigh as much as a four or a six. Right. So you don't want to get any. You don't want that fighting your very last shot for which one's going to lead the or way. Or factor it in. If you yeah, can. exactly. You got to factor it in. If you're going really tiny, you know, if you're fishing anything like, uh, you know, if you're fishing like a three or four gram float, that might make a difference. But what about water intrusion in the swivels? You ever see that and freezing out? Do you ever have issues? Do you check for that or? Like, yeah, I mean, swivels usually freeze up. That's the other thing. The bigger the swivel, the more surface area it has, the more it's going to freeze. I have noticed that the bigger swivel I use, the more it's going to freeze. So this knot I'm using is just a regular fisherman's knot. I'm just using an advanced clinch. Danny, the length of line from the bottom of the float to where you're tying that right now is that sort of typical? It's gonna it's gonna differ. Every hole you fish is gonna change. So I'm gonna go over all that, like okay. depths and stuff like that, in a little bit. Okay. So I just wanted to rig this all up for you and everything since you just bought this beautiful new combo. I got a chance to kind of show everybody how I do it. We'll put some five pound blood run leader on there for you. So you got 15 pound mainline, which means you can go up, up to 10 pound fluorocarbon comfortably. And what I was saying earlier is you always want to try to run the same brand fluoro as you do mono because there's no line police out there, so if you bought like a P line, for example, 10 pounds, yeah. it probably really breaks at like 15 or 18 pounds a lot of times. So if you get a P line fluorocarbon and you try fishing it underneath, uh, you know, a sun line or a blood run or something, you might have a problem. So a lot of times, if you're gonna buy a different brand, look at diameters. Make sure your main line diameter is always quite a bit thicker than your fluorocarbon, your leader diameter. So I was asked earlier what typically I use for like how long of a piece of leader do I typically use. I always typically run like usually an arm length is pretty much standard for me. So it's like 25 to 30 inches. If I'm fishing the river where it's really, really clear in the middle of the winter, sometimes I'll go up to like a five or six foot leader. I'll just put more split shot on it. You talk a little bit about matching leader strength with rod weight not matching it with your mainline weight correct so like when you get a rod like this rod right here is rated four to ten pound you, you're running 15 pound mainline on it it's really rated the rods really rated for your leader more than your mainline so as long as you don't go 10 pound 10 pound leader on this you're not jeopardizing the rod at all so that's was that the question yeah. pretty much yeah uh, what rod length do you recommend for a beginning center pin angler? I'd say 11 and a half to 13 foot, depending on what waterways you're going to fish. The, the, there's kind of a sweet spot on where to load a rod, because the rod has kind of a sweet spot where to load it. And a 13 foot, you get a little bit more load than out of an 11 footer. 11 footers, unless it's a softer rod, which nowadays they try to make rods a lot faster, so you don't have to put as much energy when you're putting the hook set in. Um, the 13 footer is going to help you kind of like allow you to have a longer pendulum and create that momentum to be able to just pitch the float out there with like little effort. So I was talking a little bit about this earlier, what knots I prefer and I use the advanced clinch knot all the way down from, from connecting my leader to my barrel swivel and then all the way <coughs> from my fluorocarbon down to my hook. And I pick that because the amount of wraps that I do is gonna make one area, 
it's gonna make one section stronger than another section, but you wanna make sure you use a lot of spit. When you're using like, you know, 10 wraps up towards your, your, your connection right there from the barrel to the main line, you wanna make sure that, you know, since you put so many wraps there, you're gonna put like, you know, eight to 12 wraps. You wanna make sure you really wet it and you wanna work it down with your thumb. And then when you tie your hook on, you're only gonna do six to eight wraps down here. So this is a weaker knot. It's got less wraps than this, than this knot up here that has eight to 12 wraps or 10 to 12 wraps, I'm sorry. So I'm making sure all those wraps seat real nice on top of each other. I don't have any that are going below. Though you're not doing it right now, could you talk a, a little bit about in what situations you would use a shot line? I don't think a shot, the only time I think a shot line like is important is when you're running like something like skiing and you're using a slip float is when I think a shot line is necessary. Or if you're like a high vis line guy and you like to run a lot of high vis line, then a shot line is necessary because then you can run a piece of fluorocarbon where the fish don't see it. But the shot line kind of limits you because then you're running all your shot in one section. If you want to fish like a lot of different variable water and, and like a lot of different types of water, you're not going to be able to make all those adjustments if you're running a shot line. You're going to have to carry a lot of different shot lines with you. So if you put all your shot on your main line, it's much easier. You can get all the way down to fishing, you know, two foot, a two foot spot like this. And just by checking your float, I mean, this is, this is like three foot. As long as you check your float, you could fish two foot of water with just this right here. Just by, just by how you stack your lead up on your, on your line right here. If you had a shot line in there, you wouldn't be able to cover that water. You wouldn't be able to slide it down because all your split shot would be right in the middle right here. And then if you wanted to go super duper deep, you wouldn't be able to balance your float out correctly. So I'm not a big fan of shot lines unless I'm using a slip float where there's like an inline sinker that's bringing my bait down and then I have to, I gotta get the bait to kick off my, um, my inline sinker. Like this is a rig where I would use a shot line. So this is my big heavy duty salmon rig for Lower Niagara. And again, there's really only two effective ways to float fish, and it's with a bait cast or with the center pin. It's a lot more fun with the center pin. I really don't suggest it for fishing for king salmon in Lower Niagara because once you you know, you tie in that current with how quick you have to turn the fish around. It really helps to have some gear ratio and to be able to have some drag to aid, the, aid in the assistance of turning these kings. So in this situation is when I would use a shot line because first thing I know I'm always gonna be fishing at least this depth. I'm always gonna be fishing at least six foot plus. So that's when I'll use a shot line. When I know I'm definitely gonna be fishing the length of my shot line and when I have to have when I have to taper basically from my inline sinker here, which is a half ounce, I have to make up 12 grams of weight from this half ounce all the way down to my second barrel swivel right here, um, just to balance this 40 gram float out. So when you're picking, when you're obviously when you're rigging your whole rod up, you wanna make sure you're picking the shot out, which is on that blood run flyer there. It's got all the, si all the weights of the shot. So you just add them all up with the size of the shot you buy, and it's all right there. It's a great, really great um, reference. What's, what's showing on, on that float when it's in the water, just the top? Yeah, when you weight these, you wanna to try to balance it just right, right, to that, right to where the orange starts, is where you wanna balance it. You're basically, when that fish grabs it, they don't wanna, you don't wanna have them feel any resistance. They wanna be able to take that float down like with no resistance at all. Because if they feel it, a lot of times they'll spit it. That's why, uh, like, weighting your float, that's one of the most important things you can do. What kind of, what kind of line runs the poundage on that uh, level one? So. Uh, that's a 23-pound um, blood run floating mono, which I was running braid prior. And I was having a lot of problems with the braid sinking on me. So I do these big, long monster drifts at Devil's Hole. I go to lift my line out of the water to mend it so I'm connected to my float. And I'm pulling, like, I have to reel in, and I'm, by the time I reel in to stay connected, I already had pulled it out of the drift. So 
I went with the Blood Run floating mono on that. It's 23 pounds, so it's plenty. And then I got 15 pound liter. And what was happening once I put the floating mono on is I pretty much just put my finger on the spool, lifted my line over, mended my line, and I was connected to the float. So the floating mono is really the way to go in almost all circumstances if you're using a float. What kind of reel is that you got? Uh, that's Alexa. Oh, okay. Yeah, Dio Alexa. 100? What was that? Is that 100 or 110? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I think it's a, I think they go, I want to say it's a 50 maybe. I don't know. I'll have to look at it in a second for you. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to rig up a soft plastic bead. And I was kind of describing it earlier with one of those little tiny red beads on the inside that, you know, is kind of tough to explain. So I'm going to pass one of these around for you so you guys can see it. This is a sinking plastic, sinking soft plastic. These are made by Steelhead Stalkers. It's really the best in the industry right now. So I'll let you guys check these out. The little beads on the inside are what you peg them with. And they're, it's my favorite way to fish beads because you could change the color of bead just by sliding that off your hook and putting a new bead on versus a hard bead where once you peg them, they're on there. You got to cut your rig off and redo it and everything else. It's kind of a nightmare to do. How big a difference is it in fighting a salmon on a four and a half inch versus like a five inch or larger center fin reel? Is it that big a difference? Yeah, I mean a half inch is a huge difference. Like when I made the five inch reel to a five and a half, the five and a half inch size is really what the guys are using for the salmon. But you know, I like fishing center fins for salmon as long as they don't, I have some room to play them. Where I fish in the Niagara, they're, I'm catching them all in small little eddies. So it's like I have two seconds to turn them before they go out in that main current. So I need that gear ratio to be able to pick up on them before they get out in the main current. And I'm using quite a, he I mean, it's a pretty heavy rod. It's like a 12 to 25 pound rated rod. Uh, if the goal of a long float rod is to keep the line off the water or assist in it, why would one need a floating line at all? If the goal, because then this way your line isn't submerged under the water. So when you go to set the hook, you don't have the line all the way buried down that's submerged. So you're just lifting the line that's floating on top of the water, off the water, and it's a lot easier to get into a fish. And like I was describing earlier with the braid, when my line was floating when I was fishing for salmon, um, I was running a braid. I was having a hell of a time mending my line when I was when I was float fishing, you know, with uh, down at the river. And I was using a ten and a half foot. I suppose if I had a a twelve foot rod, it would have made that mend a little bit easier. And the longer the rod, I mean, not only does it does it aid in the you know helping you kind of direct and steer your float, but it also allows you to run lighter leaders because it works as almost like a spring type of thing. So the longer the rod, the more springy it is too. So the purpose of a long flow rod is not to keep your line off the water all the time. It's not all the time, it, it aids in it. Yeah. So but I try to- mostly assists in the mending of the line. The mending of the line. The so when guys see me fishing a lot of times, they always say, you know, they're always amazed that I don't keep my rod way up here. I always keep my rod kind of close to the water and I'm kind of just directing my float into where I want it to go the whole time. And this way, when I set the hook, if you're keeping your rod way up here, you're kind of like trying to get the best connection, you're keeping your rod way high. When you go to set the hook, you're not, you have nowhere to set the hook. You wanna kind of be down low, guiding your float, and then you know more or less cast it where you want. So I'm, I'm quarter casting down river a lot of times to try to get the float where I want it, rather than, rather than trying to drift it in the spot. I'm casting a little pass where I want it to go, quartering it down river, and then pulling it right into the drift. And then I'm mending my line over and letting it drift. But you know, nowadays it's shorter rods are actually getting a lot more popular. I'm having a lot more people request 11 foot rods, 12 foot rods. In the past, it's all been 13 to 15 foot. Like I was explaining earlier, I find it's more difficult to control a rod past 14 foot. You're kind of losing some of the ability to control your float um, just because it's so hard to wield around a 15 foot rod, it makes it more difficult. So I think kind of 13 foot's kind of a sweet spot or 12 six is kind of a sweet spot. Why are people choosing the little bit shorter rods? It, they're small? just, it seems like they're a little bit more easy to control and it just seems like it matches up more for their water weight. So for example, like when, you know, the standard for this, for buying a flow rod, would you'd buy a 13 foot flow rod and you'd run eight pound mono and you'd run six pound fluorocarbon. 
well, guys come into my shop all the time, and they, they, you know, without any assistance, they'll pick a, any eight pound right off the shelf, and they'll pick any six pound. They're not looking at diameter differences or anything, which is throwing them into all kinds of problems. And a 13 foot rod and a four and a half inch center pin was always kind of the standard. But now guys, with all the different options and everything that are out there, guys are kind of fine tuning the rod and reel to their river of choice. So there wasn't five and a half inch center pins in the past, and there wasn't even a lot of five inch center pins in the past. So it seems like the bigger reels are more popular, but the shorter rods are becoming more popular as well. All right guys, so like in that little packet I was passing around, you see these little tiny glass beads that I had in there, and those are for, like I was talking about earlier, those are for pegging that little soft plastic bead. So what I typically do is I'll run it through my line, I'll kind of lay the bead in my hand, and I'll kind of pick it up with my fluorocarbon, and I'll kind of get it through, and then I'm gonna run it through two more times. And a lot of guys, this isn't too difficult for me because I've done it a lot of times, but guys have a hard time doing this in the cold. So like sometimes you could pre-rig this before you get out there, kind of do a couple liters with this little bead already attached and a hook. So you just tie it to your barrel swivel if you break off. So you're just replacing? Just replacing your leader. With this rig, the, the worst case scenario, if you're doing it properly, if you know, if you have everything in line and you don't have any um, you don't have any fraying on your main line, the worst case scenario is you're gonna break off on your fluorocarbon. That's the worst case. So now I got this little bee that I this little tiny glass bee that I threaded through three times. Now I'm not gonna tighten it up yet. I'm just gonna kinda leave the line loose on the bead and I'm gonna select a hook. So those are a 10 millimeter soft plastic bead. So right off the bat, I can run a smaller hook than if I was gonna run a hard plastic bead because they hang onto that soft plastic a little longer than the hard plastic. So I'm gonna select a size eight hook to run those 10 millimeter beads. Hey Danny, there was a question about uh, when and is backing required on a center pin reel? Um, it's kind of debatable. I mean, it's not 100% required. I suggest it, and you know, from the beginning of time, I always knew that running back, first thing, a lot of these reels are kind of made for east or west coast, so you know, they're gonna be running a lot heavier lines out west, so they need that space on their reel, which we don't need, because we're running 10 and 15. They're running 20, 25, 30 pound main line, so they need that space. So I don't see guys out west running as much backing, but they still are. The backing does a couple of things. First thing, you, you spend five, six hundred dollars on a reel that has a lot of porting on it. You don't want to have, you know, the back, or you don't want to have mono, you know, clinching down on that spool. Like the backing kind of cushions it a little bit. And the backing also is a lot lighter as far as overall weight, even though it might be a 20 or 30 pound Dacron it's a lot lighter in overall weight than the actual mono. So the mono weighs a lot more. So what that's doing is it's distributing the weight of the line, the, the heavier weight on the outside of the reel, making it have better inertia. And you're also getting, you know what, I, I fished a reel, the same reel with backing and without backing, and it felt like the reel with the backing was working together kind of all as one, better than the reel that just had straight mono on it. It felt like it was just a heavy, spinning spool where the backing kind of put that light feel towards the center and I was able to feel like the, the reel was like a whole thing was working together. Does that answer the question? Good. All right. So again, the hook that I'm choosing is a straight eye wide <coughs> gap hook. Like I said, a size eight or a size six. I typically like a size eight for these 10 mil beads. And the best hook in the industry right now is definitely the blood run hooks, hands down are the best. Can I pass a hook around without you guys hooking yourselves? I don't wanna get sued or something. Yeah, this is a straight eye wide gap hook if you guys just wanna pass that around, that's kind of my choice. You're down. Now there's those little stops don't come with these. You gotta buy those. No, they do. They come with oh, these. With this brand, they come with. So the Steelhead Stalker is the only one that comes with these small glass beads. 
You could also get them at the craft store. So what you're looking for is you're looking for a glass bead with a big eye, but one that won't that isn't too big. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want the glass bead to have some weight to it, so it helps in sinking the bait down a little bit. Um, and you want them to just make sure you get one with a big hole and rounded edges. So you'll see, you know, you'll go to the craft store and you'll see a lot of these little glass beads you buy have sharp edges. Yeah. So when you're running your line three times through it, you could fray your line. So right. try to find one. You'll notice these ones have rounded edges versus ones you buy at the craft store. Oh, yeah. But steelhead stalkers are the only ones that actually come with the beads with the actual. You went through that three times. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and it's 15 degrees in the water. Yeah, I mean, you can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. What's, what size hooks are you? These are an eight. eight. Yeah, these are blood run eight. That's a stupid little question. How are you? How are you keeping your leaders then? If you're if you're pre-doing your leaders, you I don't I don't pre-do any of my leaders personally. But oh, I okay. I know talking to guys, they have them on like a little wheel or a piece of styrofoam, and then they put them in a bag. Or there's actually leader like actually little cork wheels that they wrap the cork around. Is there anyone in here that pre-ties their leaders? I don't. So how do you guys how do you guys keep them? How do you guys keep your leaders? Keep them in a separate, real small plastic bag. Yeah. Okay. So you can That's do. Not the same thing. Yeah. Don't fall I actually use one of the Lindy Walleye. Yeah, that was what I was referring to. Yep. You can wrap like eight or ten of them on there, and you can have eight or ten different. Yeah. So there you it's go. It's starting to get. I, I do that too, but it, it starts getting into uh, space. How much you want to carry? It's probably big enough as a fanny pack. Fanny shot him in his store. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you're really, I I used to wear a vest, and my vest used to wear like 50 or 60 pounds. Like, my shoulders were like this, and I swear, like, a lot of my, yeah, I mean, my friends would pick up my bag, and they'd be like, or my vest, and they'd be like, what do you got in there? That's ridiculous. What knot are you running on your? So these are all, these are all advanced clinch knots. So like I was saying before, I'll run 10 twists up near the barrel swivel up top here, and I'll run seven twists at the bottom. So. Ideally, if I don't have any phrase in this in this knot or in this uh, fluorocarbon here, it will always break at the hook before it breaks at the at the barrel swivel because there's more twists. The more twists, the stronger it's going to be. So you wouldn't you wouldn't run a snell at the bottom? I, no, because it's a straight eye. If I was running an octopus hook, I'd always run a snell. It all depends on how that knot is coming off that hook. If I ran a if I ran a clinch knot on a straight eye hook. It would be coming off in a weird angle where it would want to pull out of the fish's mouth. And if I ran a, a clinch knot on an octopus hook, it would be kind of angled like like so, where the whole time it would be working out of the fish's mouth instead of working up. The snell knot goes through the eye, so it almost creates a straight eye for you. So when you do this, when you first rig these beads, you don't want to tighten down your knot to your hook right away until you make the adjustment to your small bead. Because if you tighten that all down, that bead's going to be locked into place. So you kind of what you want to do is you want to, from the hook side towards that small little pegging bead, you want to start working it forward from the hook side, hook side towards the bead. And then once you get it to like one and a half to two inches away, all you do is you pinch the bead in between your your thumb and your pointer finger or whatever you're comfortable with pinching the bead. And then you could uh, just just kind of pull it on both sides and you'll be uh, right where you need it to be. All right, so now I got that bead right where I kind of want it. And now what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna tighten I'm gonna tighten this knot down and it's also at the same time it's going to cinch down this bead to kind of keep it in place as well. So I'll re-wet that knot. Why do you put three times through that bead? Because two times, two times where it would slide too much, three times is kind of the sweet spot to lock it and you could still move it around. Um, if you go four times, it seems like it's too much work. That three, that three times is like the sweet spot from what I've seen. Isn't it for the, for the no, I don't get, I don't got any kinks at all right now. You can see I don't have any kink at all. So that's why I said if you tightened it at first, yeah. if you like did, if you if you tied your hook on and put a tight tie in your hook, and then you 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 know it would be you'd be kinking your line to try to slide that back down.
So I got that right where I want it. So now with these soft plastic beads, you don't want to hook them right through the center. You kind of want to quarter hook them through the side. So you got four different spots to hook them. You know, the, the other kind of bad thing about these soft plastic beads is that after a while, you have to get rid of them um, because, you know, after you hook them four or five times, they start to just kind of slide down on their own. But right when you hook them, it's, it's the same thing as a hard plastic bead. If they are, you know, if your bobber goes down and you lift up and, you know, you feel like you had a bite and the bead slid down to your hook, that means a fish had it in its mouth. So that's how you know you had a bite with, with these guys. So I just hook, kind of quarter hooked that bead and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold both, both sides tight, the hook side and the side going towards the swivel tight. And now I'm gonna bring that over top of this, over top of this. I'm gonna kind of create that nice blood dot natural look I was talking about earlier that you get with these. I could actually cut this and pass it around. No, don't. <laughs> I'm retired on that. I'm retired. I gotta do. I gotta put. I gotta put the split shot on now. So I got a little bit of time. I'll retire for you, Albert. Don't worry. I gotta put all the split shot on. So. So that's how these guys look, Rick. If you want to pass that guy around. I don't know if you saw how hard it was for me to bite through. That's only five pound fluorocarbon, but you'll see it's. Yeah, I just have a tooth that's extra sharp oh, for that problem. stuff. You know, ah, no. I've been sharpening it for Bring years. Your <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to do that. That thing's gonna be gone by the time I'm sixty. There you go. I'll have a fake tooth. Titanium there. teeth. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my split shot on. I think my split shot. So what I do with my split shot is I kind of keep, they're kind of all rubbed off, but on, the, on that blood run flyer, you'll see all the different sizes. There's like, you know, triple A, A, B, 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 all the different sizes. What I'll do is I'll get like a assorted box like this, and I'll actually label all the different sizes of the split shot with that same weight on it. So for example, if triple A, what is triple A weight, 1.8 or something like that? 0.8, okay. So what I'll do is I'll put AAA.08. So if I ever don't have that flyer on me, what I'll end up doing is I'll just look at this and I'll able, I'm able to balance that float out just from that. So I'm gonna look on this float. This is a three gram float. So where do you fish normally, Albert? Cat Creek. Cataraugus? Okay, so I'm gonna put a little bit bigger of float on for you than if you fish a cat. And that's what's so nice about these fishing like a fishing a stem float that has all the same size stems you can I could take that float on and off and change it no problem so you could take that little one you could go and fish big sister one of the little small 18 mile creek one of the branches or something with that three gram float but I'm going to put something a little bit heavier on probably like a six or a seven grammer for you if you're going to fish a cat So what I'll do, I'm gonna put a 7.5 gram on for you. <clears throat> How much these hooks are? Uh, the hooks are 5.99 for 25. They are really the best hooks on the industry. In the industry, I've been fishing for a while, and I haven't found any that are nearly as sharp. They're actually almost hard to tie a lot of times because they're sticking to your fingers as you're trying to tie them. <laughs> How about the hook set with the diameter on the, on the hook? The, the hook, di the diameter of the the gap of the hook, not the gap, no. no. The, How the length of the? No, 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 the diameter of the actual wire hook. Oh, it's like if it's a 2X or a 3X? Yes. So pretty much like, you know, depending on what the bait I'm using is. See, the Blood Run hooks are awesome because they start at size 20. And, and it's like the bigger they get, the thicker gauge wire they get too. So like the size 20 almost seems like it's a 1X wire, but the size 8 seems like a 2X wire. So all for steelhead, you know, unless I'm fishing like 
for really pressured fish, I'm always gonna fish like something with a 2X wire. If I'm gonna go to Bird Dam or Oak Orchard and it's gin clear water, the fish have been pressured, I'm fishing a single wax worm, I'm gonna be fishing three or four pound fluorocarbon anyways, so sometimes I can get away with a 1X wire. So that hook doesn't bother you at all? No, no. Okay. I just try to match it up to my bait. I yeah, I, just I was curious. I don't want to dampen the action of my bait too much either. Like if you guys have ever seen a trout bead hook, they're super duper thick, yeah. and I think they kind of kill. They they dampen the action of that of that um, bead so much <clears throat> that I feel like it almost like weights it down a little bit too much. As you're changing float sizes, you're using the same scheme with the tubing, same tubing scheme. Yeah, yeah, the same tubing. Yep, for for each float. Like I'm, I'm having a little bit more of a hard time. This is a cut. These are like custom made floats. These aren't like typically like a float you would find. Like these are actually river woods. I was trying to give Albert something that would be good on the cap, but I'm having a hard time getting it on. That's actually just the silicone tubing. So I'll try to find one that's got a little bit thinner. I got a whole booth full of good, like, blood run ones, and I didn't bring any of them. Um, are the blood run ones, are they a carbon stem, Greg? The new uh, floats, are they a carbon stem or are they a wood stem? The shaft. Uh, I'd say that's carbon stem. Okay, so like most of the companies like Raven and a lot of the small the small producing float companies all use a carbon stem and it's pretty much the same across the board. This Riverwood float, this is made by Jim Butler and he's kind of a, like an old school Canadian pinner who's yep. been making these forever. Yep. And uh, so he kind of used a wood skewer. So this is gonna be a little different tubing than you'd use for a, a traditional right. one. So I was just more curious about the same scheme meaning three pieces. Yeah, yeah, th those are all going to be the They're same size. The um, unless I'm using like a Drennan loafer. If I'm using like a Drennan loafer right. like this, yep. I got one big one at the top, yep. one big one at the bottom for my backup that I'm sliding at the base down here, and then I'm cutting that long one to slide down here. So I always have two of the same size for a backup for up here, okay. is what I'm doing. Okay. Good. So Albert, come by, I'll give you a free seven grammer because I don't have one that's going to fit on me right now. Okay. So. You're getting the primo stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's just trying to get you back to his booth again. <laughs> <You're going. laughs> exactly. See all the, all kinds of it. things I need to buy now. <laughs> All right, so the reason I like I was explaining like I like to run three is because I have the bottom one where I'm gonna stack all my lead. It goes past the graphite shaft, so I'm not gonna have any rattling at the surface. So it comes past the graphite shaft at the bottom. I have a backup for my top. So this is my top silicone tubing. I have a backup for that one, which is right here. So the reason for the backup one is, you know, you guys that have been fishing before, I'm sure you've had your top one. If you're fighting a fish or you're in a snag and you're jerking and all of a sudden that top one rips and now you're like, oh my God, I only got one piece of silicone tubing and you're trying to figure out a way to work it up past your shot and all that, it's a nightmare. So this way, all you do is slide this big one down past it, replace the top one, and then you're, you're good to go. You don't have to re-rig all just for a piece of silicone tubing. But that's usually where it goes. It usually rips through that top one because that's the point that you're gonna have all the pressure. Huh. Hey, how much how much time do you check your 
How often do I check them? Yep. Um, I'm the whole entire time I'm trotting my float. I'm never taking my finger off the spool as it's drifting. So the whole entire time that that float is going down, my float is always angled up towards me. I'm always trotting, and I'll check. I would say, depending on the depending on the hole and where I think the fish are in the water column. Okay. I'm I'm pretty much the float is telling me when I'm going to check it, but I would say I would. I mean I. I get 70, 60 to 70% of my strikes on the check. So I would say that like I'm, I'm doing it like four or five times per drift. So, and guys, for you don't know what checking is, it's when you actually stall your float out. So what it's doing is you're putting pressure on your float. So your float's drifting like so, you know, it's because you want to match the subsurface current speed, not the surface current speed. If you match the surface current speed, your float's going to be going down river like this, and you're going to hit the fish in the face with a split shot first, which you don't want to do. You want to hold your float back, let the bait present itself first, like on your blood run flyer. You can see all those different rigs. Um, the float's always angled up towards you. The, the more pressure you put on your float, the more your float is going to angle up towards you, and the more, the more your bait is going to rise up in the water column. So you're able to cover a lot more depths of water just by checking your float and trotting your float and slowing the spool down. So when I'm checking it, what's ending up happening is I'm drifting and it's, it's, I'm level pretty much, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at a nice diagonal and when I check it, that diagonal is changing and it's stalling the bait and the strike zone a lot longer. And that's why I get a lot of the strikes. And it's, I think it's more or less a mix between putting it up right in front of the fish and leaving it there for him for an extra second to make that decision whether to bite it or not. How long would you actually check your floats? A lot of times when I'm doing it, I think I do it too long and I'm actually pulling my float out of the line that I want to be in. Yeah, well that's, that's why I was kind of talking about like, I do a lot of casts. That's why I quarter cast a lot down river because I'm checking my float so much. I'll start up above where the run is and I'll actually cast quarter cast down to the run and a little bit past where I want to be. I'll mend my line over and then I'll kind of pull it into the drift. So a lot of time I'll cast it past where I want to be, pull it into the spot and then what I'll do is I'll mend my line over and then I'll keep working it. And then I'll take a step down almost like a fly fisherman would work his way down but I'm able to cover it in a, in a quicker, quicker <coughs> manner more or less. But you're keeping your bait in that zone on that scene the whole time. Uh, exactly. And I'm just pulling it in there and I'm directing it with my rod. Mm. You know, everything your rod is, it's just your direction tool on where you're going to pull it. And then once you hook a fish, it's your spring so you can run those really light leaders. So pretty much like if you look on the back of that flyer, I'm gonna just traditionally do a, an accelerated, a nice easy accelerated shot pattern, which I'm gonna start from lightest and go to, uh, I'm sorry, going from heaviest underneath the float to going lightest down by my barrel swivel. So now you could pretty much, I've seen guys run, you know, just two different sizes of shot. They'll run size one and they'll run size four and that will cover everything for them and they just bulk up their shot. And then there's guys that run all the way, you know, SSGs that weigh two grams and they'll go all the way down to something that weighs, you know, 0.4 grams. But the idea is to come up, that's a seven gram float. So you want seven grams. You want seven grams or underneath as it. close as you can get yep. to seven. And typically why I run that leader like I do, like the arm length leader, I'll still put a couple split shot on that, where if I want to cut that off and put a jig on, like a 32nd or a 64th ounce jig, I just slide those two split shot off, and that will make up for the jig weight that I'm going to put on. Because primarily I'm fishing jigs or eggs pretty much all the time. What about the uh, sliding egg sinkers? Are you a fan of those? Have you seen those used? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, between those and the um, the inline trolling sinkers, I kind of, you know, I kind of like them both equally. I think I like the trolling sinkers a little bit more because I don't have to use like a bead at the bottom of it from, um, from so my bobber isn't constantly, um, well, I'm trying to think how I rig those. 
Yeah, you know I have to run a bead above and below those where the trolling sinker I only have to run one bead. So with those egg sinkers I run two beads, with the trolling sinker I only have to run one. So you're running it fixed, you're not actually letting that egg sinker slide down and hit the swivel or slide No, down I am, that's why I am, that's why I, I put the bead there to protect that from hitting it, from it sliding down and hitting the swivel. What kind of jig hooks you have? All voodoo. Voodoo? Yeah, voodoo makes the best. What was that? Do you have them in your booth? No, I don't. I don't have a, I don't have my booth. But if you look up Voodoo Custom Tackler, you come in the shop, I have them all there. He runs like, you know, they're all 3X strong wire. The eye of the the eye of the jig hook comes up past the hook where the hook yeah. bend is. So the hook point is lower than the eye of the hook. And that's what you're looking for in a jig hook. You always want the I'm sorry, you always want the you always want the eye of the hook to be shorter than the hook point. That's what you always want, so you have more surface area. I mean, float fishing, it's all about like these fish making a decision real quick as the bait's coming by, so typically you're looking for a hook that has a lot of surface area to it. Where's your shop at? We're not from around here. Is it around here somewhere? It's like 30 minutes south here. It's like 10 minutes past Buffalo. It's in Hamburg, okay. right, oh, on, okay. right on the lake. Okay. Yeah, it's right on Route 5. So what I'm doing is I'm running, I'm running a couple ABs, then I'm going down to BBs, and I'm going down to ones, and I'm gonna finally finish that size four for this rig. And Albert, I promise I'll tie that back on for you, but I'm gonna probably leave this one he's without panicking, it. He's panicking. <laughs> I'm gonna probably leave it unrigged for my casting demo, so. What I'll do is, since there isn't a jig, um, there's no jig uh, diagram on the back of that, so I'll show you how I rig a jig up. And when I'm referring to jigs, I'm pretty much talking about if you any like, you know, anything from uh, thirty, anything from a sixteenth ounce all the way down to a um, uh, eightieth ounce, anything in that range. I'm either fishing a soft plastic, or marabou, or rabbit strips, or something like that. Marabou is probably the most, the one I use the most out of all of them, though. So I have my whole little assorted box of split shots right there. And, you know, since I always run size four on my leader line, that's going to be the one that I carry, like, in my terminal tackle box the most. So if I break off my fluorocarbon, I have my size four there ready to pull out and put it back on my leader line. So you'll fish that leader even if you break off six inches? Yeah, I'll fish that leader. Sometimes once it starts getting shorter, I'll slide one of the split shots off because, you know, if I start off with two split shots on that rig, what I'll want to do, and I'll kind of, depending on where I'm fishing, if I know I'm going to be fishing a lot of slow water, I might only put one split shot. If I know I'm going to be fishing a lot of little pockety water and stuff, I'll run two split shots on that. So I'll kind of <laughs> plan that out. I mean, when a size four doesn't make a huge difference when you're rigging this whole right. thing. It's a pretty minimal if you look on the back of that. Yeah. All right, so once this is all rigged up, I got these pretty nifty, pretty nifty things called rod huggers that I use, which are these little tassel looking things, pom poms and all the other rods. You have those in the booth. Yes, I do. All right. <laughs> no <more's good> <laughs> No horse clip, hair clips. Yeah. Plastic hair clips? Plastic hair stuff? clips. Yeah, oh yeah, I don't these, these are great. These have a nice have bead on them. Plastic, yeah. yeah. These float if they fall in the water, and I got these really cool new ones that are specifically for three-piece rods, because you'll see when you break down a three-piece rod, you'll always end up having like some extra line. So if you have that rod hugger down there that's got that new little hook lock system, you're able to use that you, so you have like a hook keeper down here now and those new rod huggers that I have at the booth, which are pretty cool. So what I'll do is I will pass around, I'll pass around a couple of marabou jigs and I'll draw up a jig uh, the way I would rig up one of these jigs. Dan, we're running tight on time. We gotta head over. All right, well, I guess I got any, you guys got any last questions really quick that 
you want to ask before we go do the no yeah, the, adva the, the advance no the advance uh, that was just from the entry level I was yeah. pretty much what I was getting at and I can explain this at the booth is when you're drifting yeah. the whole idea is to basically slow the float down so it's not going the speed of the surface current you want it to go the speed of the subsurface current so you're always slowing this down at all times and as you slow your float down your bait kind of rises in the water so the more you slow it down, the more your bait's going to rise up. So you could fish 10 foot a liter in an 8 foot hole as long as you're keeping pressure on it as it's drifting. I got you. So, but if you want to check out the casting, guys, that's going to be the most important. I know most people want to see that. So. Okay. Right. Coming back here. Uh, probably not. No, I'm gonna leave all my stuff. The video is on Facebook. On it's it's uh, live right now. Yes, it'll be it'll be on the uh, Facebook page blood, permanently. Blood run tackle. Yeah. Okay. What you need to do? Is add the current on the diagram. What's that? Add the current direction on the diagram. I think it's on there, isn't it? Nope. Oh. Right. Carry something? No, I'm gonna. I got it. I'm gonna just. I'm just gonna take two. Uh, Just bringing one or two setups, Dan? Yeah, I'm just going to bring one, yeah. Hey, Meg, we're out in uh, Niagara Falls, New York right now at the uh, Fishing Expo, and we're doing uh, this basic center pin demo right now live with Danny Colville of Colville Precision Reels. We're going to walk over to our indoor spot to do some casting demonstrations with our center pin reels. You know where it's at, bud? Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. I can go online and see my own personal video from my own personal ride. <laughs> Let's go this way, guys. Let's go this way. Yeah, it is. I tried to go Everybody watching live, we're waiting for Danny to show up. We're gonna start our live center pin casting demonstration. Just hang tight here for a minute or so. Thanks. How small a line guide you have on <laughs> Hello, Captain Eric. Thank you, thank you for joining. Anyway. 
going to sit here and you're going to go that way, I think? Uh, I guess Which way do you want to go? I should probably come this way because it might be hard to see the real. Unless, yeah. oh, you can just come on this side. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. asking. Would it be whichever way? Yeah. I have one bigger than that. seven or eight foot, this is a 12 foot rod, so I have like seven or eight foot. You wanna make sure that your hand stays below the reel at all times, so wherever the reel goes, so if you come across your body, if you come from behind your body, you always wanna make sure that your hand is at the bottom of the reel, no matter if it's this way or this way. So once you get that pendulum going, it's gonna be hard because the ceiling is lower than this. Just kind of cast it like that. I'm gonna have a tough time with this. Uh, yeah, yeah, I might have to come a little closer. Yeah, yeah, whatever you got to do. Closer is better. Are you way over here? No, I just I don't have as much room as I really need. But So I basically, the whole key is to make sure you don't reel it up too close to the tip of the rod, because if you do, you're not going to be able to load it properly. Second key is to come down with your fingers down below the reel. And the third key is just to kind of get your timing right. So you just come down, and you can pull, and then you got to slow it down with your finger like that. And that's constantly giving you a, a non, you're not getting any, you know, any um, line twist on the side. So again, I'll kind of slow motion that. All right, so I got my pendulum. It's nice and easy I'm coming down. And then I'm going to slow it down. And the whole time, these fingers are going to act as a guide as they come out. You're keeping the line on your fingers the whole time. Yeah, because if you let go, it's going to happen. So, and you could do it this way. You could do it under. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. I just don't have the room. I'm trying to do the best I can. But, but do you see how, I mean, I don't really have to come much behind me with this cast. Everything is staying pretty much straight in front of me as long as you're working on this pendulum. So a lot of times you'll have brush behind you and everything else and makes it difficult to cast. You stay right at the bottom and you really just pull down to give it the force you need. And I'm slowing it down with my finger right before it hits the water. I'm slowing it down. So that's why feedback in the middle helps a lot. Dan, has that reel got the soft rim on it? Yeah, this it? has a textured rim to it. And so you're not using that at all during no, the I'm cast? No, I'm feeling, yeah, like see this finger on yeah. there? So like a BC cast, if I was going to do a BC cast, you see how this is kind of spinning on its own? Yeah. Okay? What you would do is you kind of just load the rod and you get the timing right. Yeah. So you load the rod, let it start spinning, and you kick it out like this, and then you just stop it. That's another thing. It's all about that pendulum, though, <laughs> keeping enough you there. For, you know, what I see guys do is they reel it too close to the tip of the rod. You're not able to load the rod properly. Like, I won't be able to pull that up and place it if I'm too close to the tip. So typically, if I have this down where I'm able to really swing it, I don't have to come far behind me. I can cast it, and I can slow it down. So I mean that's as pretty much as far as you should need to go. And this is only this is only like a six gram float too, so I'd be able to get this with an eight or ten gram float, I'd be able to get it a lot longer. So and then 
And when you retrieve, you just bat the reel down like so. It's just how you retrieve it. You can reel with your handles. Your reel, you have the cool nifty finger tabs. Yeah. You can just reel with those. Yeah. There's a little synchronization. So basically the key things are, you know, I'm, I have enough line from the tip of my rod to my float. I'm creating momentum, swinging it back and forth. And you can kind of just place it. Like you could just kind of pick a spot. Keep your finger fingers downwards. Don't come underneath. Don't go like this. It's a lot more difficult to control. Fingers down are much easier. How many fingers you put in there? Just two fingers. My middle finger and my pointer. So I'm staying there. I'm coming back. I'm taking my finger off the spool, and then with my ring finger, I'm slowing it down with this finger as it gets close to the close to the head in here. I think we're good, man. I'll do it one more time for everybody. So that's pretty much as far as you would need to hit for most spots. Uh -oh. <laughs> Well, that's right. We good, you guys? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank we're gonna guys. sign off here, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow at noon Eastern time doing advanced center pin yeah, techniques like, uh, the with Danny Colvale again here live on Facebook in Niagara Falls, New York. Thanks. No, Thanks for like hanging out.